thanks everyone uh, for having us here today and thank you Hugh for your words. We are excited now to introduce our next panel. These panellists have really been at the forefront of advocating on these issues in the Australian political context. They've been there for the ups and downs of Australia's action on these issues. Please welcome them to the stage. <laughs> Zoe Daniel, an Australian Member of Parliament, Reverend Tim Costello, Executive Director of Mike Australia, Mariam Vaisada, Afghan Australian Leader and CEO of Media Diversity Australia, and Bianca Manning, a proud Gomorrah woman and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Justice Coordinator at Common Grace. So let's get straight into it because Zoe, prior to becoming a politician, you were a foreign correspondent reporting on crises uh, as diverse as Venezuela to Vanuatu, right across the world. And yet right now, as we've heard this morning, we're entering a different period in the world, a period that many are calling the poly crisis. What's different about what you're seeing now in the world compared to prior years? Look, I think the reason that I'm in politics was because I saw the leading edge of that poly crisis. And it's interesting coming on after Hugh's presentation because a lot of those photos really resonate with me as someone who spent a lot of time in disaster zones, covering cyclones, hurricanes, covering bushfires across the world, covering conflict, civil unrest, hunger crises, uh, desperate poverty, and also human displacement as a result of those things. And it was an enduring concern for me that as policy makers, leaders weren't addressing these things, that the short-termism of politics was really affecting visionary thinking about how to address some of these issues. And the final thing that I would add is that where my mind is at now is how you begin to take action on many of these enormous things that are facing us as a society, given the lack of trust in leadership and government and business, uh, and specifically the rise of disinformation across the world, uh, and therefore the difficulty in actually implementing effective policy when people simply don't trust anything that comes out of their leaders' mouths. And for me, that's the, the existential threat, actually, because if people don't believe the starting point when you're trying to shift thinking and create systems change, particularly on big picture things that take a long time to fix, it's a very difficult starting point. Thanks, Zoe. And I remember as a young, uh, young person watching the news briefs that you've been doing from around the world, and that was inspiring to many of us who've seen that and have had an interest in these issues. And so we're glad to have you in Parliament now representing us, as we know that you've been a global citizen for a long time throughout your career. Bianca, I'm going to turn to you as a young First Nations leader. You have been doing a lot of shared advocacy with your Pacific brothers and sisters throughout the region, in particular on the issue of climate change. Most recently, we were in Parliament where we uh, took a delegation and we met with, I think, over 50 politicians. You met with the Foreign Minister. What are you noticing about some of the shared challenges on climate change and the power of shared advocacy with our Pacific brothers and sisters? Yeah, thanks so much, Matt, and Yama, everyone. Um, as we heard in the Welcome to Country this morning, um, the concept of country for Aboriginal people is one that is truly encompassing of all of our life. Our culture, our communities, our identity is wrapped up in country, in the environment, and uh, in being part of the Pacific Australian Emerging Leaders Summit and advocating with my Pacifica brothers and sisters, we've found so much commonality and so much solidarity in our worldviews around climate. Um, I've learnt the term whole of life approach uh, from my Pacific brothers and sisters, and there truly is this spiritual and cultural connection to country that our well-being, that our health as people, um, as cultural people, is completely wrapped up in the health of country, in the health of our lands, of our waters, of our air, all of it, of our plants and animals. And so I think in, in advocating together, it's been a really, really uh, incredible approach to be able to 
come together and speak to our nation's leaders to take action. So, yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Bianca. We just have a bit more fun when we do it that way as well, don't we? I know the Pacific... Uh, and that's right, the dancing and singing. It just makes it that much more fun. Um, Mariam, I'm going to come to yourself. So, uh, you were born in Afghanistan. You came over with your families in 1990. You were just seven years of age. When you arrived, you described yourself as being shy and introverted. There's a lovely photo of you uh, on the ferry in Sydney Harbour. Very shy. Yes, but since then, well, that's it. Since then, you've become a huge human rights advocate in Australia, also named the most influential Asian Australian leader last year. We first met together when we were advocating uh, on the crisis in Afghanistan after Kabul, f Kabul fell to the Taliban, where the Afghan diaspora really took the lead in your Action for Afghanistan campaign, but then others in the Australian community rallied around you. Mm. What was that like? It was incredible, and I am grateful to you, to Tim. Um, I remember, you know, um, being in Parliament with you when we were fronting a press conference, if you remember that. And, um, I, you know, I remember saying, as Afghans, I shouldn't be begging for my humanity. Um, sadly, uh, two years on, uh, my own extended family members that I spoke about quite a lot doing media at the time are still... Um, trying to escape. Um, they're in neighbouring countries and um, the processing of those applications have been horrendously slow. Um, so that, that situation continues and I get, I'm regularly reminded about what more I need to do on that space. But as we were calling for, you know, as an Afghan, I was calling for my humanity, begging for my humanity. And I note that Palestinians are doing the same as we speak. Um, and I can't, um, you know, we can't ignore the fact we're calling for a safer world and it should be a safer world for all. Mm. Um, and, of course, what happened on October 7th was absolutely horrific. Um, but right now, uh, this room has about 450 people. Um, there's been over 30,000 people that have been killed in Gaza. So that's this room wiped out 66 times, gone each time. Those of you in terms that I, you could probably relate to more, Taylor Swift, there was 90,000 people at her concert. That a third of her concert being wiped out. So when we talk about climate justice, when we talk about poverty, when we talk about youth empowerment, all those key themes that we're discussing, all of them relate to what is happening uh, in, in the Middle East right now. And so... And the reason I feel strongly about that is because Afghanistan is something that was personal to me and it still affects me. Um, but when it comes to what's happening in Gaza in particular, I have a, f a friend who lost 16 members of her family in one go, 16 members. Um, I think Australia should be doing more, isn't doing enough. We heard the news come out this morning about uh, the Prime Minister being referred to the ICC that is damning, um, and I'd like to see more action taken on that. Yes, thank you, Mariam. <laughs> Tim, you have been at the forefront of advocating on Australian aid and Australia's involvement in these issues for quite a long time now, and we know that aid is needed to provide those life-saving interventions in times of humanitarian crisis like the one that Mariam has just uh, eloquently pointed out for us and there needs to be that additional aid sent to Gaza. But aid is for more than just saving lives. It brings stability, it brings progress, it can uh, bring peace when invested in the building blocks, education, strengthening civil society, gender equality. But the last 10 years on the Australian aid budget, we call it the rocky decade. What have you seen happen where do you think we're at and why do you think it's so important we start to rebuild Australia's aid program once again? You're absolutely right that aid and development is uh, actually in Australia's interest. 10 out of 15 countries in our region that were receiving Australian aid are now among our biggest trading partners. We are benefiting from it. Um, look, the rocky decade is this. Uh, aid was at its highest under Bob Menzies, 0.5% of GNI. There was a cut first big cut actually under Bob Hawke. So both sides have been cutting. Then uh, Joe Hockey rang me when he was treasurer before the 2014 budget. He said, I'm a World Vision supporter, Tim, and you're doing a great job. That's when I went, 
uh-oh, what's Joe ringing me about <laughs> and telling me that for? A million dollars cut out of aid, 2004. Uh, we have sunk to now the 28th out of 31 wealthy nations ta uh, table in lack of generosity. Just uh, 10, 12 years ago, we were 14th out of the 31 countries. Now we're 28th. And um, the Labor government is seeking to restore that, 1.9 billion promised over four years. But that just keeps it flat at 0.2% of our gross national income. There's Britain and France and Germany at 0.5%, where Bob Menzies was uh, way back then. Uh, Scandinavian countries are 0.7%. Why have we given ourselves a leave pass when we're in the region where most of the world's poor live? So we really believe that uh, Australians who are patriotic should say, not good enough, we want to do better. Thank you, Tim, and thank you for your consistent advocacy on that, through the good times and the bad times, keeping up that fight going. So you're now in Parliament, so you have a very unique opportunity to both see this and influence this. What would you like to see the Australian Government do on these issues? So my perspective on this is that we have to reframe the way that we talk about a lot of things, and it's not only aid. So things like climate policy, things like policies around gender equality, we really need to be focusing on benefit, not cost. I've found since I've been in Canberra, the automatic reaction is that's going to cost a lot of money. And my response is, yes, but look at the benefits. And that's the visionary long-term thinking that we need rather than basing everything on three-year sugar hit political cycles. So when it comes to foreign aid, we need to be thinking about what is the broader benefit to our nation, to our region, to our society from investing in support for capacity building, things like gender equality, things like climate change mitigation and a, a whole range of things that we need to invest in at a time of great global upheaval. And climate is just one example of a threat, not only within our nation, but I think there's a short-sightedness around the broader incoming impact on our region and how that affects our national security and our regional stability. So I think we need to be thinking of foreign aid as an investment, not a cost, and that's something to prosecute within government, but also to the Australian people in order to create the social licence for that investment. Thank you, Zoe. Well, that concludes our panel today. We've got a very special moment coming up next, but I just want you to give a round of applause, thank our panellists, thank them for their advocacy and their partnership. And uh, Tim and Marion, we'll hand over to you. Well, thank you uh, to the panellists for the incredible insights. And it's true that in a world facing converging crises, we can start to feel powerless. But we must not forget the incredible progress the world has made to date in tackling extreme poverty. And there is power in everyday Australians, that's you guys, you're not unifying their voices to inspire our leaders to take bold action. So that's why today with uh, partnership with Global Citizen, Micro Australia and the whole Australian Council for International Development is launching our new campaign, calling on the Australian government to act now to build a safer world for all. Uh, this campaign is calling on our leaders to increase investment in Australian aid, support a fairer global economy, and contribute to a safer climate future. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Tim. Tim, it's great to be with you today in support of this amazing campaign. At Global Citizen, advocacy in support of achieving a safer world for all is right at the heart of our mission. And that's why, together with, you, with yourself, Tim, together with the Safer World for All Coalition, Global Citizen is committing over the next 12 months to mobilize global citizens across Australia and around the region to take more than 1,000 actions emails, tweets, 
phone calls, petition signatures, calling on the Australian government to increase and provide much needed humanitarian development support to our region now. Thank you, Mick and Tim. Yes, round of applause. It is a, it's a great honour to be here, to be able to help um, announce this important initiative. Time is running out for so many across the planet as conflict, climate change and inequality are driving communities to the brink. And Australian aid can help turn that around. Well, you're so right, Miriam. And uh, communities in crisis needs supports now. And as audience members, we're asking for your help. If you can see the Q QR code on the screen, today we're ending this session asking you to follow the link with your phones, take them out, sign up to the action now, and let's keep hope alive. Together, we can build a safer world for all. Thank you. Thank you.